Good morning. So as I, as Hans Ulrich uh, mentioned, I will uh, pop up here uh, several times throughout the day. Um, so it's like it's like a marathon in the marathon in a certain sense, and speak about different stages in the historical development of art institutions. Um, the, idea, the basic idea behind this is to situate uh, Cedric Price's Fun Palace in a historical context in the history of art institutions, so to better understand what it means to speak of the Fun Palace as a new kind of institution in a way. Yeah? Um, so what I do here uh, today is structured chronologically, basically. So I go back to this very far, uh, to the 16th century. That's my first little text that I do here this morning. It's called Curiosity Around 1572. Um, so my first leap in time goes back to where it all began, in Italy in the 16th century with the very earliest museums where a number of collectors, mainly humanists and naturalists, experimented with something that should then become like the driving force of modern Western societies, both economically and culturally, the idea of the new think of any concepts of progress or development, they all are based on a belief in the value, in the significance of the new, that the new is a turn, means it turns to the better, which of course was something very strange and very alien for traditional medieval societies. So to actually emerge, to establish this shift in attitudes that was like, that maybe more than anything else signals the birth of a new sort of modern value system, a modern society to rise, um, was, a, was a huge project. And I want to focus on a, on a particular sensibility that played a, quite a big role within this process, which is curiosity. So let me start by telling you a little story about a dragon and a collector. On May 13, 1572, a fearsome dragon appeared in the countryside of Bolo near Bologna. Soon word of its presence spread and a party was sent out to overtake it. The captured dragon was duly carried inside the walls of the city for its citizens to inspect. Entrusted with its disposal, the senator, Horatio Fontana, consigned the large serpent to his brother-in-law, Ulisse Aldrovandi, a collector of strange and wonderful things, and an expert in draconology. The naturalist promptly displayed his latest acquisition in his famous museum, where, as he said, an infinite number of gentlemen came to see it. Almost immediately, Aldrovandi set about writing a treatise on the dragon, the instant book, entitled The Draconologia, and had one of the artists whom he employed full-time in his museum illustrate the dragon for, for posteriority. This is what you see here on the left side. Soon Aldrovandi's descriptions were the talk of Italy, and visitors flocked to his museum to see the serpent. In a matter of a few weeks, Naturalists, collectors, and the simply curious in all parts of Italy bombarded Aldrovandi with requests for information about it. Aldrovandi took advantage of his opportunity to strengthen his ties with patrons in Florence and Rome, all of whom consulted the collector for his opinion on the scientific and political implications of that dragon. For the dissection of the serpent in his museum, he invited the archbishop, papal legate, senators, and his colleagues in the faculty of medicine and the, at the University of Bologna as witnesses. Turning his task into a civic spectacle, he encouraged many of the principal citizens of the city to confirm what the hand of the dissector revealed, that the animal was indeed a natural occurrence. So this display of strange things as such was not new. Also medieval churches had displayed whale ribs or ostrich eggs or especially popular were dried crocodiles that were hang hanging down from the ceiling of medieval churches. But there these things fulfilled a very different function. They were there to evoke 
awestruck astonishment. Huh? They were there to demonstrate the wonder of God's creation. So they were part of a church ritual. Here, this was different. Huh? People, Aldrovandi was driven by an interest in the empirical, secular world. This is what he wanted to explore. And therefore, it was important for him to prove in front of witnesses that this animal was not a dragon, but in fact, nature, a natural um, occurrence. Huh? So he wanted to demystify nature. And this is, he was driven by this new sensibility, curiosity, huh? which marks a new interest in the empirical, secular world, which became so important in the 16th century. So after centuries where people had explained things from within a religious belief system, um, now all these things came up that lied outside of these systems, that were not yet categorized, and that, that to a certain extent had the power to discredit the claim for, to the absolute of these belief systems. Because what is curiosity? Curiosity means to encounter something that you don't know yet, huh? that you don't, cannot categorize yet, and to enjoy this not knowing, to enjoy that this is something that, is, is not, uh, that, that you haven't assigned a meaning to yet. Huh? Of course, the journeys of discovery and, and expeditions in the 16th century played a huge role in order to evoke, not just because it, they brought all this, this wealth of new things, of animals, of plants, of natural resources to Europe, which not only increased trade massively, but also evoke the curiosity of thousands of Europeans, a new lust, a desire for, for new things. Um, and of course, they played a major role in the idea of of triggering this new attitude of, a, of an open mind, of a curiosity. But in order to establish an entire social order where the new conceptualized as progress and development could in fact become the driving force, um, driving socialization, this interest, this curiosity had to be turned into a culture. It had to be practiced, it had to be habitualized in a way. It had to be turned into individualized, individual and collective practice, practices. It needed, and this is what brings me to museum, it needed cultural rituals and institutions where curiosity could be practiced and learned. And precisely this was the role of these early museums. So they functioned as laboratories, so to speak, where these new attitudes could be tried out on a small scale, before then they would slowly shift towards the center of um, society. Interest, interesting is that Aldrovandi, by the way, you can see his museum there in the middle. When Aldrovandi gave tours, which was quite normal that these collectors would give tours to their visitors themselves, but when he gave a tour, um, he would suggest his visitors to take out the things, the objects, out of the cabinets, to inspect them themselves at close range. Huh? So in a way, he, he encouraged them to assign a meaning to them themselves, to explore them, to, by taking them out of these collection contexts and, and uh, analyzing them, huh? which is an interesting gesture, because you can, only, you can only get an explorative relation to something that you don't feel inseparably connected to. Hmm? Only when you have learned to make the world an object that you're not inseparably connected to anymore, you can start getting an interest in exploring it, analyzing it, categorizing it, and so on. So in a way, you could say that this, this moment here of this museum and Aldrovandi suggesting, encouraging his visitors to take the things out marks two things that are related. First, a new explorative relation to the world, and second, a new cultural format that cultivates this non-immanent, this explorative relation to the world, and that's the exhibition. And which fundamentally is a cultural format, I said this yesterday many times, that is based on an idea of separation, no? of taking things out of their context. And this is, in the middle you see where this begins, sort of, and then on the right side you see where this ends, or at least finds its hegemonic form in the 20th century in the white cube, as sort of the space that exemplifies an idea of separation, uh, separating nature from culture, objects from processes, uh, individuals from social ties and connections and so on. Uh, so this is an ongoing sort of culture of separating, of, 
of, of, of uh, disconnecting that the ritual or the, f the ritual of the exhibition cultivates. So in, in a way, these early museums such as Aldrovandi's figures as prefigurations huh, of, of what we would co today call a museum. But it's not a coincidence that they emerge precisely at this very moment in time where also in, in, a new sort of modern attitude and, and, and society begins to slowly rise because they both are so closely connected. And from the very beginning, these museums rise as rituals that cultivates the sort of fundamental categories and new values and attitudes that go along and or bring forth this new modern uh, uh, social and economic order. And the idea of the new is sort of what marks the beginning, beginning of all this process. <coughs> Thank you, that was the first <laughs> for today. I'll continue soon. <laughs>